here with Glenn Bundman from Backblaze. It's an upcoming and very good company started in 2007, uh, and they do cloud-based storage. So without further ado, Glenn, why don't you tell us a little bit about Backblaze and what it does? Sure. Thanks for coming over. Uh, so Backblaze does cloud storage and cloud backup. So we, we actually started with cloud backup only, okay. which was $5 a month. We back up your whole computer. It's completely unlimited, and it just backs everything up to the cloud. And then if you needed any of the data back, you could download it, you could have us FedEx you a hard drive, and it would have all your data on it. And, and then if you even send it back to us, then we reprint the, the, the cost of that. So it was really inexpensive, really easy, unlimited backup. And then we built that on our own cloud storage system. And everybody kept asking, you know, hey, you know, I love your backup system, but can I get access to the storage? And eventually we decided to actually productize that and so a couple of years ago, we started working on Backblaze V2, which is the cloud storage offering. And so that one is just raw storage. You can use it for anything. It's in the cloud. People use it for, to build applications. People use it to back up servers. People use it to host data, all kinds of things. Okay. And we saw that when you first started the company uh, in 2007, we saw that you and your co-founders quit your jobs. Can you tell us a little about going through that process and what it was like to to leave your jobs and jump into this full time. Yeah, so we we went a path that was unusual for Silicon Valley. In Silicon Valley, it's very much a, you go out, you raise funding, and then you go and build your company. And we had actually all worked together at a previous startup um, where we did raise funding for it and, and it went through four rounds of venture funding before getting acquired. It was kind of more of the traditional Silicon Valley experience. When we decided to do Backblaze, we actually said, we're gonna do this one differently. And we said, rather than raising funding, we're gonna quit our jobs and commit to each other for one year, no salary, and no trying to raise funding, and we're just gonna bootstrap for one year. And you know, the thinking about around that was a number of different things. One was just being able to focus on the business and the product, because Raising funding is very distracting. Um, you know, you're constantly pitching, you're constantly making PowerPoint presentations, and you're you're spending a lot of time convincing others to give you money instead of actually building the company. Um, so that was part of it, and then the other part of it was a sense of we wanted to build a business, and it's hard to build a culture that values the concept of building a real business when money seems to fall from the sky, right? So if on day one you start and there's $10 million in the bank, it's hard to convince people you need to be really careful because revenues have to be more than costs. You know, but you're like, but we've got 10 million bucks. Um, so, you know, we wanted to build that culture of uh, a company that actually thinks of money comes from customers, not from VCs. And so for one year we said, we're just gonna do that. And then every six months we'll get together as a team and discuss, do we want to raise funding? Does it make sense or not? And the one-year commitment was really important because since we were quitting our jobs, what we didn't want to happen was, you know, two of us uh, uh, are like, yes, we're totally in it. And then, you know, two people after three months go, you know what, I changed my mind, I'm gonna get a job. And then it's like, what's the limbo land here? Exactly. So committing to each other was really important uh, on that. Um, we had worked together before and we've done startups before so the idea of quitting our jobs and doing this was not as shocking i guess but it was still a pretty big decision uh, i had a mortgage at the time um you know there were you know people were in different stages of um you know having an, uh, some savings and nest egg and expenses and families and um so it was it was not a small decision but it was we felt like as a team we could pull it off in some shape or fashion and worst case scenario we said you know in one year if you want to leave and go get a job or whatever like no hard feelings mm -hmm. right the commitment here is one year okay um now you know in fairness when i you know i had started a, a dating a girl at the time now my wife okay um and we we had only been dating for couple few months at that point and I told her hey by the way I'm quitting my job and I'm not gonna work and I can collect the salary for a year um, 
you know, she was definitely like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> um, you know, it, it definitely seemed crazy yeah. um, from that perspective. But from your perspective as well, it's more so of a calculated risk. You knew what you were getting into. It's not like, you know, just a spur of the moment, let's quit our jobs and start this company. You knew what you were getting into and you, you committed to that one year, which is an interesting kind of theory. And it, it worked out, so I mean. <laughs> yeah, and I think one of the things that made it much easier to do that was knowing the people that we were going to do this together with, right? So. Um, I do think it would have been harder to, if, if I was if I didn't know anybody was uh, who I was going to be involved with, and I just said I'm going to quit on my own and then see what happens. That would have been harder. Um, it would have also been harder if I said, "Hey, you know, Bob or Jenny, like you know, we just met yesterday. Let's both quit our jobs and do this." But um, five of us started Backways together, and all of us had worked together a number of years before that, and so we kind of knew how we worked together and how we could execute on things, okay. and that definitely made it feel uh, more comfortable to do it. Okay. Um, and yep. Should we just pause real quick? Uh, I know you can edit this out, but um, so it says headphones mute. That's yeah, that's cool. Right? I, yeah. I haven't noticed that before, yeah. so I just didn't know. It's just with this the new um, like thing attaches. I, I got scared when I first saw it, too. Yeah. I was like, it don't know. Like, none of the audio is recording, but it should be. Okay, it's it awesome. Okay. Cool. Sorry, guys. <laughs> no problem. Just good good checking. You don't want to lose <laughs> <Yeah>. that stuff. <laughs> um, and we've seen that you started multiple other companies as well. Can you tell us a little about your background um, as an entrepreneur, as a person, and maybe a little bit about the other companies that you've started? Sure. So, I, you know, I I liked tech stuff for a long time. I mean, I, uh, my my parents have this sheet of paper uh, from when I was five, where I drew them some kind of underwater submarine with you know how we how it was going to generate air by using electricity. Blah blah blah. Obviously, I had no idea what I was talking about. But <laughs> you know, at the, I was five and I thought it might work. Um, and I would you know I would constantly uh, you know take things apart, try to put them back together half the time that worked, uh, you know, and so I liked tech um, always, and I did kind of, you know, the very basic entrepreneurial stuff, you know, selling cards door to door and stuff when I was a kid. When I was 15, um, I actually st uh, started a used car dealership with a friend of mine um, before I had a license. Um, <laughs> You know, and it kind of fell out of, I was trying to buy a car, it seemed like there was an arbitrage opportunity between one newspaper and another newspaper that sold used cars. Um, later I figured out that it wasn't quite the arbitrage opportunity that I expected, but it got me down that path. And so did that for a little bit, uh, made some money there, you know, got more of the bug of, um, you know, looking for an interesting deal, uh, fixing up the cars a little bit, and then, and then selling them. Um, so did that kind of high school, early college, and then college, um, I started uh, something called the Tack Post, which was a bicycle components um, company. Uh, you know, it was a, it, it, this was not some gr grandiose uh, <laughs> success or anything. Um, and then, um, then I started something called Net Relevance um, in business school, which was, the, the idea there was, um, we, at that moment, you could install things in the browser for the first time and you could watch what people were uh, browsing. And it was at the time when Google didn't really exist yet. And the web had gotten large enough that Yahoo wasn't necessarily doing a great job um, for searches. You, you, the common experience was search, go, 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 then come back, then search, then go, 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 and come back and kind of keep trying to find what you were looking for. And I felt like we could, if we could watch what you were browsing and learn more about you in general, we could do a better job with providing you the information you were looking for. So I started down that path and then ended up joining up with some people who were doing another company, doing the same thing. They had some engineers, no business people. I had some business people. I was having a hard time getting engineers. Uh, it was 98, 99, which was peak crazy yeah. dot com <laughs> boom days. And uh, so I joined up with them. Uh, that company was called Kendara. Um, it was co-founded by uh, Pop Mutuanji and Freeman Murray. And so um, we worked on that product line and that company um, for nine months. Uh, raised uh, they raised seven million dollars um, to start that company. We hired forty odd people in nine months. Built two products, and the company got acquired. 
Um, so it was very crazy, tumultuous, you know, 99.com <laughs> boom days. And um, so they got a part by Excite at Home, worked there for a couple of years, and then left. Um, one of our co-founders here, um, Brian Wilson, co-founded uh, an email security company with uh, Pavni Devanji again. Um, I joined up with them to do that, and um, we worked on that for four years. That got acquired by Sonic Wall. Then we all quit our jobs to do this one. Okay. So it, it's been a lot of the same team kind of um, coming back together for, for a number of these things. Okay, and you said, so you have more of the business background. Um, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a mechanical engineer by, by background, so I don't code. Okay. Um, I, at some point I took some programming classes and if I had to write, you know, hello world right now, it would probably take me, you know, a month. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm technical in that I understand the technology, but I, I don't code anything. Okay. Um, and the mix for us of our five founders is we have three engineers, me doing the business stuff and one designer. Okay. And so one of the core things that we felt was really important um, for uh, for product today is actually the, the, the user experience, uh, which is why we have a full-time co-founder mm -hmm. as a designer, um, as one of the people on, on the team. Absolutely, a lot goes into the design and kind of the user design. Um, but another question that we have, because we run an accelerator back home a little bit, there's always people looking for founding partners or uh, engineers what do you look for in, in a co-founder or finding an engineer to help you with kind of another side of the business? So the, the hardest thing I think for, for companies is the, the founding team needs to be able to work well together. And you, you, you see this over and over again, you know, founding teams having riffs destroy the whole company no matter how good the technology is, the product is, the vision is, or anything else, right? So the I think the most important thing is finding someone that you can work with and work well with and work not just in the, yay, this is great, we're having a great time, but also in the, you know, the product is late to market or some competitor came out or the funding didn't come through or whatever challenge you're dealing with. Um, so finding, you know, those people that, that you can really work with through those times is, is more important pretty much than anything else. Obviously, if you're building a technology product, you need a te someone who can do the technology part of it or hire the technical people or manage the technical people. But um, if you can't work together, nothing else is gonna matter. Okay, uh, and another question back to now the cloud. Um, what is it like being in such a largely growing field of cloud storage and cloud backup and cloud this? What's it like being in that largely growing field um, and what, what did it like look like years ago when you started in 2007 and what does it look like now? And also what does it look like or what do you think it's gonna look like in a few years from now? So when we started in 2007, we were focused on cloud backup mm -hmm. and there were you know, a handful of people that were doing cloud backup at the time. The idea of just backing up data off-site somewhere wasn't new. I mean, we joked that we were a decade too late to that. Um, but you know, there were definitely competitors in the space who were well-funded uh, competitors that raised 20, 30, or more million dollars. There were companies that existed for a decade at that point um, doing it. So starting into the space with the idea of, it's five of us with no money and no plan to raise any, any funding for at least a year, definitely set it up as a little David and Goliath, mm -hmm. right? And now, fast forward a decade, we, you know, we've built a lot more scale, we've built a lot of technology, we've got a bigger team, we now store 350 petabytes of data, uh, which is, I think, something like a quarter of the amount of data Facebook stores. So, you know, it's scale, right? Uh, but now we're also competing with Amazon and Google and Microsoft, which are also slightly <laughs> larger companies. And, you know, one of the nice things is that cloud as a concept, in the, you know, being in a larger market and a faster growing market, one of the nice things is that people understand more about it. It has more awareness. It's, you don't have to be as, 
you don't have to kind of educate as much mm -hmm. to, to get um, people to understand it. One of the challenges of being in a larger, fast growing market is more companies tend to want to participate in it. So you have more competition. Um, so, you know, if you pick a super niche small market, it might be easy to become the dominant player in that market. It's not a very big market, mm -hmm. but you might not have a lot of competition. In cloud storage, it's a pretty big market and there's you know pretty big competitors. Um, the nice thing for us is that when we started Backblaze in 2007, we planned on using Amazon S3. For, we were gonna do all the backup technology and store the data on S3. And what it turned out when we did the math on it was that it, the S3 was charging enough that we would lose money on every single customer. And so, you know, we just started thinking about that and saying, okay, well, we can't afford to build this business on S3. And so is there anything else out there? No, there's no other service offering out there that's less expensive. So then we looked at buying equipment and all of the equipment was super expensive. And so, you know, we kind of looked at it and said, well, we have two options. One is to just say, well, that was a nice idea, but not gonna work. Um, and the other is to figure out some way of doing it cheaper than what is out there. And so we actually said, all we wanna do is take a hard drive, plug it into the internet and put data on it. And we ended up building our own servers. You, you saw the red storage pods. Um, so our own servers, our own infrastructure, our own cloud storage file system, the whole stack. And we did that much, much less expensively than what we could buy it on an open market, either the equipment from you know, a Dell and EMC and NetApp or uh, service from Amazon S3. And so by focusing really aggressively on the cost of storage early on, because it was, it was make or break, you know, the company wouldn't exist otherwise. Um, it allowed us this entryway where we started really just always focusing on that for 10 years. And by doing that, it allowed us you know, to stay in business, to, to make profits, to thrive, to build a business that was largely bootstrapped and not, without requiring lots of venture funding. Um, and you know, the new Backways V2 offering it was only possible because we built that low cost storage. And that's, that's a lot of the articles I read was, you guys are doing so well in your space right now because your stuff is affordable and it's it's actually really cheap compared to the other the places in the market like Amazon, like you said. So mm -hmm. if you had started there, it wouldn't have worked out. But I've seen that the prices that you charge for businesses or consumers per month or per computer is, is very, very affordable. So can you also speak a little bit to what it's like to compete against Amazon or Google, these big companies, and still do well in a market like that? Yeah, you know, the, the nice thing is that by by competing with really large companies, people know about those products. And so it makes it easy to say, it's like S3, about a quarter of the cost. Good. Right, it's, it's, it, you, you, you can kind of short circuit a lot of the, this is object storage in the cloud, it's an infrastructure as a service offering, you pay per gigabyte per month, you know, like there, there's all this stuff that you have to kind of understand, uh, and if you were alone in the space, you'd have to educate. Mm -hmm. um, here, we just say, it's like S3, it's a quarter of the price, and then anyone who knows what S3 is can kind of go, oh, do I care about price? And there are absolutely companies who say, I don't care about price. I, I have a billion dollar company, and I spend a thousand dollars on storage, I don't care if it's a thousand or two hundred and fifty dollars. It makes no difference to me. Um, there are other companies who say storage is a tremendous component of all of my costs, and by lowering the cost of storage, I can either save money, make more margin, make more profit, or I can actually introduce things that I wasn't able to do before. Um, we had we had an example where this company was taking photographs of um, for fifty years of of, uh, of the country of old. Um, farmlands and rural areas and they were selling these photographs but it was too expensive to sh store them in real time and sh and so you could only have little tiny thumbnails of them um, that you could say and go well I think that's the photo I want right but at our price point they're like sure we'll store the whole thing and then you can zoom in and see like does this photo have what I need so it actually allowed them to do new things 
um, because price was lower. And so, um, you know, competing with the large companies, on the one hand, you know, you have to overcome the, but you know, it, it's almost today like the old adage of no one ever got fired for buying IBM, right? <laughs> Today, you know, it, you might actually get fired for buying IBM, but to, today it's the, you know, nobody got fired for buying, um, you know, Amazon. And so you have to compete with that. You know, people want having some reticence of doing anything that's different. One of the ways we've been able to compete there is that over the 10 years, we have been very, very open and we've shared a lot of information. So. We've published the storage pod blog post. We've published reliability um, stats on hard drives. We've shared, you know, just tons of information that has been useful in large part to the tech and storage community. And so, even though we haven't sold storage until a year ago, a lot of the types of people who would use the storage knew us over the last ten years. Mm -hmm. And so they've already overcome a lot of the initial reticence that you would have if we had just launched a year ago and said, hi, we're brand new, you've never heard of us, you know, give us your data. It's not like that. You know, they, they've actually seen us, they've followed us, they've understood that we have a lot of technical depth and they've, they've built up this trust over 10 years that, um, that would be harder to replicate if we had just started a year ago. And one of our most important and questions that we like to ask is, if you had one piece of advice that you could give to an entrepreneur just starting up, what would that be? So I think the, the, the thing that I would say is just plan to stick with it. Uh, in, through some combination of, you know, everything's 140 characters or Snapchat fast, and also the, the minimum viable product and lean startup and all of that concept, I think sometimes that gets translated into if you're not immediately super successful, you failed and you should do something else. Mm -hmm. And I think that those two are very, very different. Lean startup is a great methodology for iterating quickly, but entrepreneurship takes time. Building a business takes time. And from the outside, it always looks like, yeah, it's up and to the right, and it's just simple and beautiful. And from the inside, every one of these companies <clears throat> You know, you go through ups and downs and it takes time and you have to figure things out. Um, <clears throat> so just, you know, when you're starting out, don't don't get the sense that, oh, I've worked on this for six months. It's not wildly successful. I, I should do something else. You know, just, just kind of wait and stick with it. Okay. And I think that is one of the myths with entrepreneurship is that when you're reading articles or watching videos, it just happens overnight like that. And it really doesn't. It's a slow kind of grind in daily um, think towards your end goal, but with you, you saw there was success over the period of a year. Maybe not, you know, widely successful, but there was success over a year. Would you kind of give that as a as a marker to if you you know would quit your job, see what it would go over a year, and then if, if it doesn't work out well, maybe go back to something else or um, just kind of have a so, vision. So the quitting your job thing has a lot to do with you know your own personal situations Absolutely. right yeah. which is uh, if if you can take the risk right so um so you know i had a mortgage but i had roommates mm -hmm. inside of our house just so that i could extend the runway of working on this mm -hmm. right um but i i also knew that I wasn't going to be destitute. It wasn't like at the end of the year, if this wasn't successful, I was going to lose my house and, and, and you know, be broken homeless. And so it depends on your, and that's, you know, that's some combination of just having time and savings and, you know, to work toward it. Um, if you can put yourself in a situation where your expenses are very low and you can just commit to it and keep working at it, that's fantastic, right? If you've got a family to feed, you're the sole breadwinner, and you've got six months worth of runway, I probably wouldn't quit my job, you know. Um, so it depends a little bit on personal situation. Um, in terms of time frame, if you can quit your job, um, I think it is dramatically increases the chances of success. I, I, over and over again, I find it's really hard to build a company if you're spending a lot of time focusing somewhere else, yeah. right? So if you have that option, it, 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 it dramatically increases the chance of success. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of time frame, I'll just give you, you know, we started in, in 2007, 
and we said we're going to give it a year a year in it's it, 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 we thought you know at the beginning when we started hopefully a year in we'll be paying ourselves salaries and it will be fine and we can keep growing the company there were no salaries a year in um a year and a half in we took a small angel round to buy servers but we still hadn't made, paid ourselves a penny um we started after that we started paying ourselves minimum wage just so that we could um, uh, kind of make sense to organizations. Like if we wanted to sign up for healthcare, they would ask for a W-2 and we're like, we're co-founders, we don't, we're not paying each other. And they're like, I don't understand, you don't fit into our model. So, you know, we started paying ourselves minimum wage and did that for like another year. I mean, wow. it was a long, slow slog where we mostly rolled all money back into servers and other salaries. So we hired us, uh, uh, Head of, head of support, um, that person made a full salary before any of us made anything. Um, and so, you know, it, it just, it takes time. Now, um, sometimes you get lucky, sometimes it goes faster, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, planning on, on a business that you find significant success in less than a year, that is a you know like hopefully within a year you're you're seeing that there's a path you know okay. you're starting to see that there's maybe traction maybe you've got you know early customers mm -hmm. maybe you have some revenue but um you know it, it gives you enough to whet your appetite that yeah. there's a path here to, to, to chase absolutely and to go back to what you said earlier you commit to doing that and you know if you don't see you see a little bit of growth but you know that over the long period there'll be more and you commit to that um, going in and then we also have another question that we like to ask um, for business students and just for students in general, we're also on a long car ride. What's a book that you would recommend um, to read that has either good knowledge or is just a good read for business students or anyone in general? So I I recently l read and loved Sapiens. Okay. It, it's not a technology entrepreneurship book. Uh, it's a it's a quote unquote brief history of mankind or humankind. Okay. It's but it's thirteen billion years or something brief. Uh, <laughs> But it's it's just a very interesting, thoughtful um, kind of uh, changing perspectives on things, um, and I think it it has some value from a business perspective in terms of understanding the concept of um, structuring fictions. Mm -hmm. um, so it talks about things like um, companies and religion and legal systems and countries and everything as effectively fictions we all believe in, mm -hmm. and therefore they work. And so there are some business lessons to take yeah. from it, but it, it's more of just, I think it, it, I found that a really interesting read. Okay, that's awesome. And, and it's like you said, it helps change perspective as well, which is also very important yeah. in life. Um, and I don't know, if, do you have any questions you would like yeah, to ask? Yeah, so uh, one question I'd like to ask you um, is if there, if there was one piece of advice you could give your 20 year old self, what would that advice be? I think one of the, the advice that I give my 20 year old self is think critically about the people you want in your life. Um, I think that it took me a long time to be, uh, to kind of focus on thinking, this is someone who I find interesting, inspiring, engaging, um, you know, positive, broadening, etc. And I should actively work to, to keep them in my life versus I think for a long time I focused more on just, you know, let's build things, let's do things, let's experience things, and people would come in and come out of life, and uh, it wasn't as um, kind of co conscious and cognizant, and there are a lot of interesting people doing a lot of interesting things, and, you know, the old adage of, you know, you are the sum of five people around you, <laughs> you know, the, the thing about that is you can control who those people are it's yeah. not it doesn't have to be random and um, and especially now with you know social media and everything else it's easier to find those people um, so you know if, if there are things you're interested in if there are um, areas you want to pursue you know find the people that seem to be doing interesting things in there and what and and reach out to them kind of like you guys are doing for your own path okay yeah, that's great. I, I love that that whole idea that you really are the product of, you know, your five closest friends. I've heard a lot of motivational speakers yeah. talk about that. Um, so, I mean, just hearing your story about your co-founders sounds like you're you're very specific um, about the people you spend 
spend the majority of your time with. Um, so I definitely, I can see how crucial that can be. Um, so would you credit the way you guys started Backblaze um, with the success of, of your company so far? Would you say that's probably the key element or is there something else that you would say has definitely led to the success you guys are seeing today? So I think the having the five co-founders was critical. I think that, you know, at the end of the day, the team is what makes everything, right? So the, you know, obviously now the success is based on the whole broader set of people that work here. But if it weren't for those five people, we wouldn't have recruited the other 50, right? right? Um, the approach in terms of not raising venture was absolutely critical for the path we took. It's not the only path out there, but if we had raised venture, I don't think we would have built the lowest cost cloud storage system out there because what we would have done is said, we're busy, we've got a lot on our plate, we've got cash in the bank, and we can buy servers or we can put data on Amazon S3, and we would have just done that. And we would have never built the technology uh, that enabled us to have really low cost storage. Right. So the, the forcing function of not having money um, was the you know it, it, it not only forced us to build the servers and build the technology and everything else it also built the culture for the company of always caring about every penny of every layer of the stack right. um, and making sure that it's efficient and i don't think any of that would have happened if we had raised venture from the get-go so just kind of form your your company around that concept that yeah money doesn't grow on trees so let's let's be aware and conscious of you know where every penny's going if, if that's the path for the kind of business you're building, right? So there are some businesses where that is not the best path, right? Yeah. There are some businesses where raising as much money as you can from the get-go and you know throwing it at a problem might be the best path. Mm -hmm. But you have to think about both what you want to do and what kind of company you want to run and also the product and the market and the challenge that you're trying to solve, right? So, uh, you know, in social networking, there, there might only be one or three companies and they're gonna be large, right? So, you know, the, Facebook achieved grand dominance, right? And so th raising lots of money to build that out and establish that leadership position where you can be the one mm -hmm. um, makes more sense than being cost efficient. Yeah. Um, but in a lot of industries, I think um, here in Silicon Valley, everybody just starts with the presumption that I have an idea, I should go raise funding. And and it should be, I have an idea, let's see if there's a way of testing out whether this idea makes the most sense and decide what kind of business I wanna structure around that. And then is the best path to build that as a business mm -hmm. or do I need to throw as much money as I can throw at it because it's you know winner take all in a you know cash-based um, path. Right, so, um... Sorry if this sounds redundant, but what would you say would be kind of be the, um, or what led you guys to choose this path when you guys were first starting out? Was it just a, a group decision? You know, we all want this culture to kind of surround it, or was it like one person proposed the idea and then you went through the 12 angry men process? <laughs> or uh... So uh, there were a couple of us that, uh, so of the five founders, um, one had wanted to start thinking about the issue of backup. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, Br uh, Brian Wilson, who's our CTO, and whose who's one bedroom apartment we basically squatted in um, to start the company. Uh, he had a friend who lost uh, data mm -hmm. and he was helping tech stuff for her. And w when he, she called him up asking for help, and, he, and he's like, sure, no problem. Like, we'll get you a new computer. Where's your backup? And she's like, look, what I don't need now is a lecture. What I need is for you to get me my data back. <laughs> and he's like, how is it possible you don't have a backup? And so uh, we started talking about that and just started talking about you know, this problem that everything is going digital and no one is backing up their data. And uh, so we started talking about that problem set and then talking about it who else do we need on the team to address that? And then from that, we, we, we went down the path of, okay, for this and for these people, how do we wanna do this? Do we wanna go out and raise funding uh, like before or not? And 
we decided that at least for one year, we didn't want to raise funding so that we could just focus heads down on exploring the problem set yeah. and working on, on a product um, to get to market. And then we would consider the fundraising piece of it. Um, so it was an early decision. Um, it, would, it was probably the two of us that um, made that decision from the get-go, but all five were bought in very quickly. Awesome. Yeah, I absolutely love that that approach to starting a business, um, kind of cutting down on the risk and making sure everyone's on board, you know, before the money starts flowing in. Uh, it's good to, like we were talking about, knowing the people you're working with. So yeah. um, I absolutely love that story. Honestly, that's really cool. It's different than um, a lot of the stories we've heard so far. So uh, that's really great insight, I have to say. Um, and it's eluding me. That's the worst. It's like you have a question it's, you're thinking of. Was right there. Or like you have yeah. a few, and then you start talking. It's always so interesting whoever you we're talking to. Yeah. And after like they finish talking, like, what was, oh, what was the next one? one? No, like, yeah. there's no one. Because it's like the previous thing you just said was interesting, so you just completely forget about it. Yeah. But. One thing that you knew about was it just tough things in the business. Oh yes. Um. So I mean, you know, in terms of the like sticking to it and stuff. Uh, so there are lots of tough things along the way in a business, right? The, the obvious ones are, you know, how do we build the product? Which product should we build? What's the feature set? How do we get it to market? You know, how do we fund it? All of those kinds of things. Those, those are the ones that people tend to think the most about. Um, the less obvious ones, they'll suck up a lot of your time. Like, um, you know, any kind of uh, either founder or employee uh, tensions or anything, um, the uh, you know uh, dealing with just random things like you know you need office space, you need uh, lawyers and legal contracts, you need healthcare, you need just basic kind of operational stuff, right? Um, so you know those kinds of things, and then sometimes just random things that you never would have expected. So in our case, the single biggest thing that could have sunk the company was none of those things, but it was flooding in Thailand. Really? So, uh, you know, we have no customers in Thailand. We have, or at least not a lot. We don't have any partners in Thailand. What, it's not like Thailand was a big market for us. Um, what it turned out though was hard drives are mostly made in Thailand. And so when there was flooding in Thailand, all of a sudden supply dried up and prices went through the roof. And in terms of you know tough things to deal with, as a company that buys a lot of hard drives and cares a lot about the cost of those drives, this was you know hugely impactful. And so you know our, when we first saw that, we're like, okay, what do we want to do? And we started talking about you know all the different options. You know, should we raise prices? Should we you know, send out a virtual donation hat, you know, to our customers and say, hey, if you like us, give us, you know, contribute some money. Um, you know, should we stop allowing new customers? Should we limit the amount of storage? Like all of these things that that were possibly necessary, but definitely not things we wanted to do. And we ended up realizing that the, the drives we were buying, which were designed to be put into servers, were three times the price. But the drives you would buy as a consumer were 10 or 20 percent more, some weird market dynamic. Um, and so, what we went upstairs, we took a whiteboard, we drew a map of the whole area, we put on there where all the stores that sold hard drives were, and we mapped where each person in the company lived and said, Congratulations, on your way into the office, one of your jobs is to stop by the store and buy some drives and bring them here and then what we would do is what we call shucking like an oyster you crack <laughs> open the uh the hard drive container and then you know we would use those drives inside of our servers and that worked fine for a while until all the stores started limiting to two per person and so then we got friends and family and eventually customers <laughs> in on this where we put up a blog post and said if you can find these drive model and uh, and makes, um, we will buy them and ship them to us. We will reimburse you and we will pay you a five dollar bounty 
for every drive that you can send us. And and we had customers from all over the country sending us drives um, that we would end up uh, racking in servers. And we bought thousands of drives this way, which you know at the time s- saved probably half a million dollars. Um, which you know at the time this was five, six years ago, um, was an incredibly meaningful uh, amount of money for us. Um, so, you know, flooding in Taiwan turned out to be the you know the biggest risk to the company. That's amazing. Yeah, so <laughs> plan as much as you can, but. That's, something's gonna happen that you did not plan for and you're gonna have to find a way to, to get around that and that is that's what we travel for is to hear amazing stories like that like you know no one thinks that they're gonna have to ask people to buy hard drives for them so they can take them apart shut them and and put them into their system so I mean that's just that's amazing that reminds me a lot of a story I was I was hearing Elon Musk talk about where they had some issue getting a shipment of USB cables in for their Tesla cars um, so they ended up like going around the whole like uh, Palo Alto area, just buying, just buying up as many as they could from all the stores and putting them in the, the cars. So I mean, I love that story. Just you know, being able to adapt and finding that kind of creative yeah. solution to a really really unique problem. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty awesome. Um, I got the question. So this is um. So what personal characteristic? of yours would you kind of credit your success as an entrepreneur so far? I think for me, it's just the ability to just kind of keep going. You know, it's I, I tend to stay relatively calm and, and just kind of take one step, next step, next step. Um, you know, if, you know, with this drive crisis, it, you know, it, it wasn't like, Oh my God! What are we gonna do? You know, you know, ah, you know. It was just okay. You know, let's talk through this and work through this. And you know, to be clear, it it wouldn't have worked without the other four co-founders, right? So I, mm-hmm. I you know, I don't think it, Backways would not be successful without the five, right? Um, but my piece on that, I think, is just staying calm and working through stuff and moving forward. Um, is probably the single thing that for me has has been the most beneficial yeah so having that the ability to just kind of just be calm that the whole grace under pressure um when it hits the fan is kind of detrimental to addressing a monsoon that's wiping out your supplier in another country and and you need different skill sets at different times so you know sometimes you want someone who who runs around shouting with their you know and screaming with their hair on fire yeah for some reason, so and we actually have, I feel like some different, um, not only skill sets, which are definitely different, but also styles, um, which somewhat complement each other at different times. Yeah, that's awesome. Having that once again, having the right team, mix of people. Uh, and then the last question for me is, uh, so what process do you kind of go through when you're deciding whether or not to take an opportunity? Um, this question we ask pretty much everybody is uh, Steve Jobs in one of his quotes said um, you know he's almost just as proud of all the opportunities he said no to as the ones he did say yes to so um, what kind of process do you go through when you're deciding whether or not the opportunity is for you I mean I've been doing backwards for a decade so uh, you know I, I'm, I haven't considered, looked at, evaluated, or, or explored any opportunities outside of Backway. So the yeah. opportunities are inside. For things, or even for the company as well. Yeah, for things inside the company, you know, it is important certainly to say no. It's also important to say yes. Um, sometimes we get into our, you know, this is the path that we're on. And, and you know, doing something that's off kilter um, is also hard to say yes to. So B2 for us was kind of a departure. You know, we were just backup and only backup. And the idea of offering storage was different. Um, and it, in some ways it's, it's it's even more different than it necessarily sounds. Oh, backup storage, yeah, kind of similar, but they're actually pretty significantly different in terms of go to market and approach and everything else. Mm-hmm. And you know the, the the 
procedure there was really thinking about um, what is the real demand and how would we be uniquely qualified for it. So we kept having customers ask us, you know, please give us access to your storage. And so we felt like there was real desire out there. Right. And from a us being uniquely qualified for it, we felt like if you look at um, what we've been doing for a decade at that point, we can see that 10 years ago, our internal costs started out lower than Amazon's. And 10 years later, our internal costs are still lower, at least in Amazon's pricing. I don't know what their internal costs are, but anything that they're pricing. And so we felt like if we brought those two things together, there's a real win here. And, you know, it still wasn't an easy decision even then. Um, you know, we had to talk about, do we believe that as a team, we have the resources to execute against that? Um, for a long time, we passed on lots of opportunities, not because they weren't interesting, but because we said the team can only do so many things. And unless we double the size of the team, we can't do this other thing. And so, you know, we can sh decide to shift, we can decide to raise funding and grow the team, but you can't simply ask the team to do this and this, or you end up doing both badly. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the, the question internally is, if we do this, can we, do we have the team capacity to do this well? Right. Um, if not, you know, should we do this instead of something we're doing? Um, but it's not doing both. Awesome. Um, and I lied, I have one more question. I just thought of the one I forgot about earlier. Um, I read about your, your blog post about the email experiment. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Because I think that's pretty cool too. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, so I have a public email address. Yep. And it's and I, it's been out there since day one on, you know, 10 years ago. And it was important for me to have a public email address because one, I don't want us to be a faceless, nameless company that that our customers feel like, well, it's just this monolith. It's like, it's not a monolith. It's a group of people trying to do their best yeah. to provide a good service. So it was important to be out there and, and be accessible. Obviously we have support, as a, as a, but if you can't, if you're not happy or something's not working or, or, or you wanna do something that doesn't fall into the realm of one of the normal channels, you know, my email's out there for people. Um, and and I absolutely get, you know, sometimes feature requests, sometimes customers that say, hey, yeah, I got this answer from support, but I'm not happy with it, you know, and stuff. But I also get a lot of basically spam. Yeah. Um, you know, or random or college days. students trying to interview you. Random college <laughs> students trying to interview me. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I get a ton of recruiter emails. I get a ton of hey, we'll do software development for you, or we'll do QA testing for you emails. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some chunk of, uh, you know, here we want to sell you this, this, or that service. Um, and, you know, and a reasonable amount of, hey, you know, um, are you interested in talking about raising funding, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and for a long time, my challenge in, internally was I didn't feel good about simply not responding to the emails. Um, and you know, I felt like even if it was just a simple no thank you, um, it was something that I prefer to do. And the other problem with it was if you don't respond, some people go, oh, well, I'll send it again, and a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time, and a fifth time, and a sixth time. And so, um, but I didn't want to take my email off for customers and partners to, to have access to. So um, I tried to think what to do, and I ended up writing up a, a, a blog post that said, Basically, here's the deal. I want to hear from you. If you know, if you have a problem, I want to hear from you. If you have a feature request, I want to hear from you. If you have an opportunity you want to explore together. Um, however, I get a lot of email, like everybody does. Mm -hmm. And if and here is you know, a an out of office that ever responds to every person, and says, if you fall into one of these standard categories, yeah. I can tell you the answer and it can be automatic. So if you're a recruiter, we're not going to be interested. So 
you know, don't, don't, you can just take me off the, off the list. If you're doing software development and you're saying, hey, maybe I'll pitch you. The answer is no, we don't do apps or software development. It's been a decade. I can tell you the answer is still no. Yeah. Um, uh, however, if you don't fall into one of these categories, like, you know, I, I will see the email and I will try to respond. Mm -hmm. So it was about level setting expectations um, for the people emailing as well as trying to let me spend more time with the people that I actually want to respond to, you know, customers and partners and others, right. um, without feeling this limbo state of, but I feel like I should respond. Yeah, that, that little sense of guilt for, for not responding. Yeah. I totally relate to that. Um, so yeah, would you say it's working so far? It's working okay. Um, I, I, you know, one of the problems is that I think some people use these automated systems to do follow-ups mm -hmm. and something about the auto office uh, way of responding to them oh. either isn't triggering that or they don't see it or something because they keep following up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in general, yeah, I feel like it's worked pretty well and I've had people respond to it and say, hey, you know, I don't fit into one of these four, you know, can we can we still talk and stuff? That's awesome. Yeah. Because I... Cause I, I wasn't expecting it when we sent you the email and then I was looking through it and I'm like wow I wonder if I could apply this to my my school email account because <laughs> um, we get bombed with all kinds of different emails and stuff like that besides the point but um, I really like that concept and, and you said you were on vacation it started after you were on vacation and you still felt obligated you know even though you were somewhere on a beach or something yeah um, so uh, this is a really cool idea <laughs> So thanks for sharing that. Sure. And in some ways, so the, um, the previous company that we did, you know, 10 plus years ago was an email security company, which started off as an anti-spam company. Mm -hmm. And one of the features of that product was a challenge response um, feature. So if someone sends you an email and they're not on your, um, in your contact list, mm -hmm. and the message looked potentially spammy, but not clear, yep. they would, it would send them uh, a picture with three puppies or two kittens or you know four cars or something and it would say how many cut puppies are in this picture okay and if you click the right number it would let the message through and it was just testing to make sure that it was not an automated robot spam system right. sending you so it was slightly uh, you know uh, thinking of off of that uh, yeah. functionality but with a little more context yeah. uh, for the users yeah